if you think about this industry, social media, and you think about how young it is, it's just 10 years old, okay? Um, it didn't exist pretty much. Well, maybe, maybe depending on which platform, maybe 15 years at the high end. There's not that many industries that are this big that didn't exist, you know, that long ago. Considering how massively huge this is and how new it is, it's, it's shocking. So what you have is you have a lot of people who around 2008, when it really started blowing up about 10 years ago, were out of work because the huge Great Recession or whatever we call it here in America happened. And a lot of people got their second careers in social media. They went from being former attorneys, um, former um, you know, stay-at-home moms that needed to go back to work or the kids were older and they needed to go back to work. And they just started realizing that they could make a career by just interacting with people on the internet. That was shocking to them and that businesses would pay them. So the stories I hear about how this thing called social media has empowered the, this massive workforce is one side of the story. And then the other side of the story is how it's empowered businesses and brands that nobody had ever heard of before to become mega brands like Zappos, right? From cave drawings to family histories to stories around the fire, humans crave order among chaos, connection amid isolation. So we tell stories. Our mission at the Storytellers Network is to bring the art of story to the masses. Whether you're in marketing, you're an entrepreneur, or you're developing your own personal brand, telling your story effectively can make the difference between celebrating milestones and collecting unemployment. The Storytellers Network strives to help storytellers tell their stories so you can learn from the best. Now, your host, the inbound evangelist himself, Dan Moyle. Welcome to the Storytellers Network podcast. You are in for a treat today. In this episode, in our season four social media storytellers, we hear from the founder of Social Media Examiner, the author of books, uh, Launch and Writing White Papers, and the man behind Social Media Marketing World, the industry's largest conference and amazing event. He's also host of Social Media Marketing Podcast, founder of the Social Media Marketing Society, the central character in The Journey, an episodic documentary that we talk about. Michael Stelzner lives and breathes storytelling and social media. It's a perfect combination for today's episode. And today, Mike shares with the Storytellers Network his storytelling craft, the fact that he doesn't think he's a storyteller, his successes, his stumbles, his next big thing. In other words, Mike shares his story. And as we get into that story, just a friendly reminder to visit us online at thestorytellersnetwork.com for past episodes, for resources on how to help you tell your story, of how to contact me if you'd like. And if you're new, text STORYTELLERS to 31996 to subscribe. It's real easy. Text STORYTELLERS to 31996. Now, let's get to those stories. So there you go. So thanks uh, for joining me, Mike. I, I do appreciate you joining me. Um, so you're a, you're a storyteller, at least I consider you one. Do you consider yourself a storyteller? I don't label myself as a storyteller, but I definitely know that I tell stories. So I guess I am a storyteller. That's right. Um, and where are you? So I, I like to figure out where everybody is, yep. the storytellers, small towns, big towns, different yeah. coasts around the world. Where are you geographically? I am in a little place called Poway, California, which is the headquarters of Social Media Examiner, which is a little city inside of a really big city called San Diego. Awesome. And how's the weather in San Diego? Perfect as always? It's not perfect always <laughs> but it is pretty good today that's awesome so if you so if you don't necessarily label yourself as a storyteller but you kind of but you, that's what you do especially you know like in this season we're talking about social media especially and you've got an incredible story there but if, if you're not necessarily a storyteller but you kind of tell stories where does that start from you do you think that's something you've always done or is it something that you've started to to focus on at some point in your life I have memories of a child being a child sitting on the porch of a neighbor's house and all the neighborhood kids sitting around in circles and me fabricating stories about their parents that were never in stories. You know, things like uh, them floating away in hot air balloons and just crazy stuff. So I've always been creative at just on the fly coming up with stories. So I would say there's a little bit of it built into my DNA. That's awesome. And it was that fostered throughout your life then too? Did you get that kind of support or was it like? I don't, think, I don't think I ever did anything like my, my profession and career and all that stuff um, has been mostly on the, 
you know, in writing, but not fiction writing. So I didn't get a chance to really exercise that storytelling more on the, you know, nonfiction side and in the marketing side. So I would say it's probably only been in the last, you know, I'm 50 now. So it's probably only been in the last 10 years that I've had a chance to really bring that storytelling exercise back from childhood. Gotcha. And so when you talk about the last 10 years and, and professional storytelling, um, I know, I know some of your story, but let's get into that a little bit for, for sure. listeners. You know, you've, you've written books, you run social media examiner, obviously the huge event, social media marketing world. Right. Um, so let's talk a little bit about social media in particular. Have you always been fascinated with that as long as it's been around? No. no. Um, actually I thought it was kind of weird in the beginning, to be honest with you. Uh-huh. I was a writer So I was a professional writer and big businesses hired me to come translate the gobbledygook from their engineering team and product marketing people into something the sales team could use, right? So I'd write these things called white papers, which are article meets brochure. And all of a sudden around the 2000s, mid 2000s, you know, I was mostly serving tech companies and around the mid 2000s, early 2000s, tech bubble exploded, lost a lot of clients. And then I started to notice like, 2005 ish people started talking about like LinkedIn and Facebook a lot. And I was like, I wonder if there's a connection between that and the white papers. And if I can connect the dots, cause like the people that were hiring me to produce these white papers were marketers and the marketers seemed to be going crazy about these social networks. So that's what got me intrigued. And I started writing for my industry, the white paper industry, showing them by bringing in a little experts of how potentially they could take this, boring thing called a white paper and maybe get some leads or exposure over social media. And the more I started writing about like how to do something on Twitter or on Facebook, man, that stuff just exploded in popularity. And I'm not just talking about like in my industry, like the whole industry. And I began to say, what? There's something here. So I saw the early opportunity to potentially transition my entire business and focus on this new thing that was known as social media. My first thing that I did, Dan, and I think you know the story, is in 2009, may not know this, but I decided to come out with a report and I called it the Social Media Marketing Industry Report. And I had surveyed thousands of people, mostly my friends, their friends, their network on Twitter, took a survey. I knew how to do surveys because of my white paper days, I knew how to write reports. And I called it the social media marketing industry report. And this is the first time anyone in the world had ever used the word social media and industry together. All these people started going nuts saying, we're an industry. What? (laughs) And that's when I started, you know, connecting all the dots and the rest is kind of history. Now we're kind of really helping that industry grow quite a bit. Yeah, absolutely. You are a thought leader for sure. Do Do you think that there's, there's a chance is there an opportunity in reports like that and white papers to be a storyteller? No, I don't think there is necessarily a chance to be a storyteller, but I think you can have stories around it. So Hmm. um, I would say that the data, it's hard to make a story around something as boring as charts and data, (laughs) you know, inside of a report, but it's easy to stand up on a stage and say, here's what the data shows us. Here's what it means. And here's some examples of people that are successful and you can share their stories. So I think there's ways you can, you can leverage data and you can create stories behind those data, that data set, and you can get very, people very excited about it. Well, that's cool. And, and for that report, is that kind of when you decided the social media might be a field to yeah. really dig into for you? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I was still all focused on white papers and, and I got a crazy idea after that report. I thought to myself, maybe, I should try to see if I can go get a domain. So I went and I was able to find social media examiner shockingly was not taken. I registered it for like $10 on GoDaddy. And then the first thought in my mind was that I'm going to get sued by the San Francisco examiner because I'm here in California. So I trademarked it just in case. (laughs) (laughs) That's smart. (laughs) That's smart. You know, and then I reached out to some of my friends who were writers and I said, do you want to write for this new thing? I'm creating a little movement here and if you could just please submit one article a month until it doesn't work for you anymore and I'll write four. And we got to the point where I got enough people to write one a month and I wrote one a week. And then all of a sudden everybody wanted to write for this publication because it was the first publication that was actually teaching how to stuff. And everybody else was complaining about social media back then. You know, they were personal blogs 
mm-hmm. saying what they hated about Facebook, but nobody was actually giving away information. They were all trying to say, come hire me. And I was mm-hmm. trying to say, no, no, give it all away. Cause I learned that from the white paper days, give the knowledge away, prove your expertise, and then they'll come flocking to you. That's cool. And, and it's, it's incredible to see the growth from back then to what it is now. I mean, where do you think social media is going next? Whew, that's a big question. Right. <laughs> um, it's hard to answer when you're thinking about the billions of people that are using social platforms, right? I think that where social is going next is um, all the, a lot of the social media platforms are, are, are rushing to, to compete with television, right? So you've got this concept of native video and you've got the Facebook watch platform where people, they're trying to get people to watch videos, shows on Facebook that are just like shows you might watch on Netflix, right? Um, so I think what's happening is there's this great race to try to capture the living room and to try to watch content on the social platforms. Even LinkedIn, you know, now has native 10 minute videos. So that, that's, the, that's the near next, but the long-term next is really gonna be in the augmented and virtual reality space. And that's where you've got the Oculus platform from Facebook and Microsoft coming out with their stuff. And I think that these platforms are just gonna try to try to make everyone's life and all aspects of their life better by, you know, first connecting them, then layering stuff on top of them in the augmented reality world. And when you say make it better for us, do you think that it's also making story better in general? I think so. I mean, um, I don't know. Have you ever tried a virtual reality headset? Uh, I did actually. Yeah. There's a, a virtual reality com- company story up that does, that, that takes, takes air quotes, uh, veterans to Washington DC to see their memorials. And wow. I, and I, and I used to work with uh, a group called honor flight that does that like in real life. But story so up they, was doing, they do it with a immersive headset kind of experience. They do it, yeah, for the for those that can't leave the house or leave the nursing home or whatever. That's a great example of where I think Incredible. I think this can can alter storytelling because right now, like with Oculus Go, which I have, which you can get one for 200, 250 bucks, I can watch Netflix on a big screen even though I'm just wearing it, it's like IMAX size. You know what I mean? So I'm watching and I'm fully immersed in a story, even though it's like a screen, but it's just going to be a little bit longer and that story is going to completely cover my peripheral vision and I'll be able to look around. And I think that's going to create a new immersive storytelling experience. Even the idea of being able to go sit into a front row of a concert or a, or a sporting event, mm. you know, it's going to allow us to experience things. And I think experience and story are closely tied. So I do think there's going to be something there. Probably video games will be the first frontier really. And they, and they actually are as far as immersive interactive storytelling. Yeah. And it, it's incredible. Speaking of video games, the storytelling that goes into those video games now and the production and it's just, man, it's, it's bigger than movies, man. It's a big industry. Yeah. And, it, and it's, and it's incredible to me to think about, you know, if I, when I, when I first started the podcast uh, this year, well, actually last year, but anyway, when I first started the podcast, I thought, you know, storytelling to me is so much, you know, writers and that kind of stuff. But when you think of step back and think about it, I mean, it's everything from writing to video games to, to being on the stage to live events. It's, it's, it's huge. Kind of, yeah. How do you, how do you think, so that's how like social media technology affects storytelling. How do you think storytelling affects the world of social media? Um, in a pretty substantial way, because from a business perspective, the second you walk into a restaurant or establishment and you have bad service, you're going to go tell that story on social media. Um, and that story could have legs forever right? So people tell horror stories of bad service experience. So the flip side of that is it forces businesses to actually up their game and make sure that they're, I think that social media, people have told stories on social media and it's scared the heck out of businesses and they've upped their customer service. Like we now have, we can now say that service, high quality service is becoming the norm because people expect it because of the, they're so scared of this negative stories being told on social media. Mm-hmm. Cause let's be honest, you don't see too many positive stories. <laughs> right, right. right. It's easy to so tell the negative ones. Yeah. It's become a huge accountability factor for business. And I think that's kind of fascinating and kind of has a really big cultural impact on quite a few things that we can't even fathom. So do you see social media as kind of democratizing the power of the consumer? Yeah. Which is the big brands. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I mean, if you think about it, it started with blogging, right? Blogging democratized anybody to be able to write something. You didn't have to have a print publication, go to someone's mailbox. 
podcasting did it with radio. You didn't have to go through a producer, right? You just publish your own podcast. Mm -hmm. Social media brings all that available to any audience anywhere, potentially in seconds. All you need is a hashtag <laughs> right. to be discovered. But yeah, for sure. I think, I think it's the great equalizer for sure. So tell me, uh, Michael, about taking that social media world and getting it in person. You've got the event, Social Media Marketing World in San Diego, and it gets bigger every year. I hear so many people going to it and see everything on social about it. What's it like for you to have that event be tied to what you started from a white paper world into what you are now? How, what's that like Honestly, for you? Honestly, I could have never in a million years imagined that I would have an event that in 2018 had 4,200 people from 50 some countries wow. come to take over the San Diego Convention Center. I, I, I could never have fathomed it and hopefully 7,000 next year. It is kind of hard and I'm kind of glad, like if I was able to travel into the future and see what I built, it might've freaked me out, you know what I mean? <laughs> And I might not be willing to do all the hard work that it took to get here, yeah. or maybe I would be motivated to work harder. I don't know, but it is kind of crazy. And uh, yeah, I don't know. That's I, don't even, I might've gone off on a tangent. What was no, the original question? Just what it's like. I mean, that's exactly yeah. it. Like, yeah, it's, it, crazy. It's, it's hard to fathom, but I will tell you, it's not easy. My gray is way more gray. <laughs> I look, okay, I'm 50. I look back at pictures when I was 45 and I had almost no gray. Mm -hmm. So in a matter of five years, just the stress, you know what I mean? Of, of, um, of a growing business and of all the things that you need to do and trying to satisfy all the different players that are involved and in the 120 plus speakers. And it's just madness. It does require a certain level of like groundedness to be able to do the kind of things we do. And it's, it's, um, but it's, it's, it's also fun, man. I used to work at Sharper Image when I was younger. I don't know if you've ever been to a Sharper Image. Do you know what they are? Yeah. yeah. So for those that don't know what they are, it was a store that sold really weird tech. Every week, the store would be reconfigured. Every week it was, and it was Richard Tallheimer was the founder. His goal was that, so that every week, if a man walked into the store, they would see something different and they would make it a regular routine that they would want to come into the store and buy from this essentially eclectic museum meets high tech. And that taught me when I was young that um, change is actually really, really a good thing. So I just kind of learned to embrace it and roll with it. It can, be, it can be a powerful motivator to get people to come around, right? For sure. And you know what? In the social media world, <laughs> change is, is a stat. Is, I mean, that's the only constant. <laughs> every day. Every day they're changing something. So I, I, can, I can hear the passion in your voice about the event itself and, and connecting with all these folks. Have you seen – like? So I want to preface this by saying, you know, I think a lot of people look at social media as this kind of, you know, playground. It's kind of a toy or whatever. But in reality, I mean, I, I got to believe you've seen it change people's lives when they oh, come yeah. to your event and talk to you. I mean, tell me about that. You got a story that stands Boy, out for you? There's so many stories. I can't even begin to know where to start. <laughs> but, but yes, um, if you think about this industry, social media, and you think about how young it is, it's just 10 years old, Okay. Um, it didn't exist pretty much. Well, maybe, maybe depending on which platform, maybe 15 years at the high end. There's not that many industries that are this big that didn't exist, you know, that long ago. Considering how massively huge this is and how new it is, it's, it's shocking. So what you have is you have a lot of people who around 2008, when it really started blowing up about 10 years ago, were out of work because the huge great recession or whatever we call it here in America happened. And a lot of people got their second careers in social media. They went from being former attorneys, um, former, um, you know, stay at home moms that needed to go back to work or the kids were older and they need to go back to work. And they just started realizing that they could make a career by just interacting with people on the internet. That was shocking to them and that businesses would pay them. So the stories I hear about how this, thing called social media has empowered the this massive workforce is one side of the story and then the other side of the story is how it's empowered businesses and brands that nobody had ever heard of before to become mega brands like zappos right a company that sold shoes that ended up being acquired for a billion dollars by amazon got famous because of twitter you know and because they were just all over the place and people were talking about them on social platforms because of their amazing service 
who would have thought that you could receive shoes and mail them back? That was a foreign concept, right? And the list goes on and on and on. So it just brought these really innovative businesses together with these passionate people and just kind of exploded. And big, big businesses, you know, have been built on the back of social media. Oh, yeah. And I hear, I hear a thread of hope in there. Whereas so right. often, like you said, early, even just in the early days, people complained about social media. I think they're still there, right? They're complaining about, you know, all the politics or all the junk or all the whatever, all the spam. And like, there's a right. thread of hope there, actually. I think there is because while it's true that it's changed and now it's not free as much as it's got to pay, there's still, op- there's still incredible opportunity. I mean, and there's just so many people, for example, that came out with a YouTube video and, you know, and all of a sudden they're on America's Got Talent or people that are using Instagram or even Vine, you know, when that was around, mm-hmm. they were doing six second videos like Zach King is a great example. I don't know if you knew who Zach is, mm-hmm. but Zach is this guy that's kind of a digital artist slash magician where he would do these crazy things where we're using um, After Effects or one of those kind of things. He would do these crazy tricks. And before you know it, he's on The Amazing Race and then he's got book deals and now he's got a movie deal with Amblin Entertainment and the guy's just like a superstar. It all started because he was doing six second videos on Vine, you know? And it's just, I think just, I don't know, it's, it's, it, it, it's really hard for me to find a single story. Dan. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, so and, and do you like, is it okay that there's still this kind of underbelly of crap out there? And because we have so much great stuff, the guys like Zach, where he yeah. used vine for good. Whereas, you know, there's also this other side of it. I mean, how, so, so it's, so it's okay. How I, look, there, how I look at this. Um, in the beginning, there were three television stations, ABC, NBC, CBS, right. Then cable came around and there was a lot of crap. And you know that that's true, right? Mm -hmm. But there was also a lot of good that came out of having like a hundred channels because if you were a sports person, you could tune in just to sports 24 hours a day. Or if you were into home improvement, you could turn into home improvement channels or food or whatever, right? Then all of a sudden, what ended up happening was the internet popped, right? And then all of a sudden you could get, you could read blogs on every conceivable topic, but there was a heck of a lot of crap out there too, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And then all of a sudden, you know, it just keeps expanding and expanding and expanding. So when you give a platform, when you make it easier to get into a platform, everyone rushes in and the good rises to the top and the crap, hopefully, you know, people ignore it. But the reality is there are always going to be people that are going to abuse. There's always going to be people that use it for bad. And there always has been from the beginning of mankind until when people could first write or first speak, you know what I mean? There were crazy people and there were good people. And it's not that, that, that it's not that it's just that it's easier for these messages to disseminate. So in the end, um, I think, I don't think they're evil or good, but I think that they're important. And I think in the end, uh, the most important part of all these things is allowing people to gather around common interests. And that's what I'm excited about. The idea that you can have someone who has, for example, pink cancer, you know, like, like um, uterine cancer, you know, and you can have a uterine cancer Facebook group where people from all over the world who have uterine cancer can come together and support each other for good, you know, or you have people that are, I, I was just on another podcast for, with this woman who's a pet, she, she's an expert in the pet walker industry literally. And all these people that are pet, that this is their side hustle and they walk pets for a living. She's the the leader in that space. Okay. And she's been able to use social media to gather her tribes into Facebook groups and events and stuff. And she is the world's leading pet walker expert. I mean, like you could never have had that back in the day. Right, Dan? Right. Yeah. That's incredible. So it's cool and it's good, but it can be used for bad. It can be used for good, but it's not like you know, it's like a car, right? A car can be used to crash into people or it can be used uh, autonomously to get a kid picked up and to school. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's just, it's just a vehicle. That's how I look at it. Uh, that's a great, that's a great perspective, Michael. Um, so let's talk about the journey and, you know, knowing a little bit about yeah. what you do, you know, besides running social media examiners, if that's not enough um, and, and this big events, uh, yeah. you have, you have this episodic documentary video going on. Yeah. Tell me how that started and what that's like as a storyteller. Well, first of all, it's absolutely crazy. Um, I got my inspiration from shows like The Prophet, Undercover Boss, and Shark Tank. I don't know if you ever watched any of those shows. Uh, and, and, and Survivor. 
I'm a huge Survivor fan, and Survivor was the ultimate inspiration. I met a guy that was the co-executive producer for the first eight seasons of Survivor, and he told me kind of how they do what they do. And I was like, mind blown, okay? So um, I believe that there's this appetite because of shows like Shark Tank and The Profit for business stories, right? People want to actually understand how businesses get started, how businesses struggle, how businesses are transformed, and how they survive and thrive. So I thought to myself, all right, in my industry, there's a lot of people coming out with how-to videos, right? That's the most common thing. And there's some people doing personal video blogs, also known as vlogs. But what I don't see is like a, a storyline that has a, a beginning, middle, and end, right? And I thought to myself, what if I kind of borrowed from the best of all these different industries? And I created a episodic documentary where the goal was to um, have X number of people attend a conference and it would be the, the struggle that I and my team faced trying to meet that goal and it would end with the culmination at the conference. So that was the storyline that we built in season one. It was a huge success. We didn't have a lot of people watching it, but we did have a lot of people watching it depending on your perspective. So we had about 10,000 people watch per episode, you know, for our industry, that was a big deal. And this is how I, I'll tell you I know it works. I'm on the keynote stage at Social Media Marketing World in front of 4,200 people teaching, doing my opening keynote, and I get to a point where I talk about the journey, and I start hearing some whoops, whoops from the audience, and I say, hey, just out of curiosity, how many of you here watch the journey? A third of the audience raised their hand. Wow. That's over 1,000 people that raised their hand that said they watched the journey. And, and then I said, whoa, hello, everybody. There is proof that something like this actually works. People came up to me and they said, I'm here because I watched your show. Someone turned me on to it. I loved it. I bought into your vision and I wanted to come experience it firsthand. And over and over, I heard that. And Dan, you want to know what it was before? It was the podcast. So it used to be like, I love your podcast. I listened to your podcast. I wanted to come. But man, that video documentary trumped anything that I'd ever done before. Wow. So I was just like shocked. And all I did and, and by the way, if you want to check it out, it's journey.show on YouTube, socialmediaexaminer.com slash journey on Facebook. All I did was I just got a guy with a camera to follow me around. And I did some of it with my iPhone and some of it with little cameras on my computer. And I just filmed some of the, some of the struggles and some of the wins and some of the meetings that we had about how we were getting creative and innovative with marketing our event. Never, not in one video did I have a call to action that said, come to our event. It was a true documentary about the event. And I, I never once said, now come meet us at the event. But I did remark it to people that watched the video mm. on YouTube and Facebook and got them, you know, hey, you watch the journey, come experience it for yourself in real life. Because that's the advantage of using social, right? Is that you know who's watching it and you can market to those people that watch it. And it was crazy. So we just started filming season two. Uh, episode three just came out today. We're, we just cut episode five. I literally now have a full-time employee that this is all he does. And it's pretty nuts. But it is crazy. And it's taught me a lot about storytelling and a lot about humor and a lot about transparency and just all the things that, that people love and, and what they relate to. And it's just been really kind of a crazy ride. I can talk about whatever part of it you want me to. That's awesome. And do you think that that transparency and authenticity is a big part of what draws people in when you're doing a video story especially? Huge because you know this old adage, people buy from those whom they know and they like and they trust. You've heard that before, right, Dan? Oh, I've said it a ton. <laughs> and on stage, I wear nice clothes and I look very professional like any other businessman. But my real me is t-shirt, jeans, t-shirt, shorts, flip-flops, sometimes even barefoot. And the real me is quirky. The real me is um, dyslexic. The real me says stuff that makes people seriously laugh. Um, and the real me is also exceptionally intense and stressed and all these things. I'm a real imperfect individual. And it turned out that by showing the real me and the real team that people just couldn't get enough of it. And I knew it was risky, but at the same time, I just got this sense that if I could show them what I'm doing, they would learn about marketing by watching and if I showed them who I am, they would also grow to understand and maybe respect and maybe even like me. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. And I got to tell you, we ended season one in April and I 
must have gotten hundreds of messages between April and September when we launched season two saying, when is season two coming? <laughs> Isn't that crazy? That's incredible. I'll just, just watching you put on an event. Like that's. And it's not just me putting on an event. It's me struggling to figure out how to achieve a goal. Yeah. And it's, and it's, and it's how I bang my head against the wall and how I try things and how I reach out to individuals and how I think and mm -hmm. how I deal with dilemmas and, and just all those kind of things that, every single person in business deals with, you know, and that's the part that, that people love is because they're like, Oh, he's just like me. Oh, he's struggling with the exact same things I'm struggling with. People would blindly reach out to me and, 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 and actually say, I've been watching the journey. I have an idea to help you. And these ideas wow. would be huge. So all of a sudden I got this tribe of people that weren't just watching, but that were actually rooting for me. It was crazy. Probably feels pretty amazing to have that buy-in come just from the content. I mean, that's it's nuts, man. It's been nuts. And it's just like, that's why I believe video is such a big deal, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I know it's not for everyone, but you know, it is really, I think the ultimate storytelling. And we know this because we watch movies and we know this because we watch documentaries and that's mm -hmm. the ultimate form of storytelling. I think because it's the, it's the most raw, Mm -hmm. authentic, especially when it's not scripted because I don't script anything. And it's, and it's the next best thing to real life, right? I mean, to sit down with somebody and go through it with them is one thing, but we can't all be there. So that video connects us so well. So that's awesome. Yeah. And people uh, want it. It turns out they really want it. And, and yeah. their story that they can connect with and that they'll stick with it. Yeah. This is, man, this has been, this has been incredible. I could do this all night with you. Um, but I know you've got some sunshine to go enjoy. Um, <laughs> uh, but I appreciate your time, uh, Mike. And what, if, so I, I like to get to this one just to kind of have fun with people or maybe stump you. If somebody told you now, maybe this would be easy for you because you don't label yourself as a storyteller, but if somebody said to you, all right, Michael Stelzner, you're done telling stories. Mm -hmm. Give us one last one. What would your last story look like? Holy cow. My last story. My last story would take place on the ridge of the Grand Canyon on the Northern Ridge. I had... I was, well, to back up a, a few hours earlier in the day, I was at the top of the ridge and it was snowing and I didn't have gloves. So I took my socks off, put them on my hands and started hiking down the Grand Canyon. About a third of the way down, a sign says, if you don't have a gallon of water, you likely will die and we will not airlift you out. Are you sure you want to keep going? I decided to keep going. As I'm coming down the canyon, I see people coming up out of the canyon looking like they're dead. And I'm thinking, you're just not as prepared as I am, folks. So eventually get to the flat part of the Grand Canyon with some of my buddies and it's now time to start going up. And I was like, that wasn't that hard. Of course, I've been going down thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of steps. Now it's time to start going up those steps. And eventually I start realizing all the training that I had been doing was for nothing. I, my heart did not, my, my physical stature, even though I was like 21 and in the best shape of my life, I was not prepared. And eventually, uh, my friends start getting ahead of me, and I start watching donkeys come past me, and I'm thinking, man, there's some wisdom in the people that took those donkeys. I find a little tree. I yell to one of my friends, hide some, hide some of that dried fruit you know, in the next tree because it's going to be a while. Eventually, I get to the top, and um, as I'm coming out of that canyon, I see people just heading down for the night, and I'm thinking to myself, you have no clue what you're in for. And eventually crashed. And I think that that experience is a metaphor for my life because that experience is one of, we are never ever prepared for what's around the bend, yet sometimes we just gotta go for it. And sometimes we gotta rely on our friends. And I don't know why that would be the last story I would tell, but that's the one that came into my brain because it's just kind of a nutso story that it's a true story that happened to me. And there's so many little sub stories that I could tell, but I would tell the story of the grand Canyon just cause it's a cool story. And inspirational and educational and everything I know about you yeah. that you strive for. So that's a good one, man. Thank you. What's man. uh what's the best way for people to, to find uh, Michael Stelzner? Um, social media. You could just Google Michael Stelzner and you could reach me on just about any platform. Twitter is Mike underscore Stelzner. Or you could just go to socialmediaexaminer.com and there you'll find absolutely everything. Excellent. We'll put them in the show notes, man. Thanks for your time today. I really appreciate you being on the show. My pleasure.
And there you have it. Mike Stelzner, our social media examiner, social media marketing world conference of the journey. Man, that guy does not sit still. Thank you so much, Mike, for joining us. Really appreciate it. Listeners, be sure to go visit Mike and social media examiner online. You can find links to all those resources in the show notes. And if you enjoyed the episode, please consider sharing it. You guessed it in social media. Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, wherever you want to share it, please do. I do appreciate that very much. And consider leaving a review as well. Those always help to uh, give a little legitimacy to the show. People go read through those and they go, oh yeah, this guy doesn't suck, right? At least I hope so. Uh, and if you're new here, you want to subscribe, text storytellers 31996 and you can subscribe. Thanks for listening. Until next time, here's to telling our stories and having stories to tell. Cheers. Cheers.